Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Worship in Spirit and Truth. And at this point in the teaching, I'm emphasizing our freedom in worship. Because if we're going to worship God freely, we have to be set free from the things that would hinder us. Now, what are some of those things? First of all, it could be our religious background. Many of the early Christians in New Testament times were saved out of a pagan background. And much of that pagan worship was centered around bondage in so many ways. Uh, religious traditions which were idolatrous and, and the Bible says that this is a form of bondage and when God calls New Testament believers to worship him he calls them out of their religious and spiritual bondage so that they can worship him in spirit and truth. I guess also there were certain numbers of traditions that other religious people had for example, the Jewish traditions, Jesus himself said that very often the traditions that were prevalent in the religious life of Israel at that time were traditions which somehow obscured the face of God. They were traditions which emptied the word of God of its power and Jesus was constantly calling people back to the true worship, the pure worship of the scriptures so that they would be set free from all forms of religious traditions. Then of course there's the freedom that we enjoy in our morals because sometimes pagan forms of worship involved gross acts of immorality but when we worship God in spirit and truth we worship as renewed people, people set free from all these things. And then the Apostle Paul speaks so often about worshipping him with spiritual gifts and enjoying the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome back to the Sword of the Spirit teaching on worship in spirit and truth. We've been looking at worship in the Old Testament and we spent two sessions on that and then one whole session speaking about the Psalms and now we're going to look at worship in the New Testament. And the first thing we notice is that Jesus and his disciples they continued the pattern of Old Testament worship by observing the Sabbath, celebrating the festivals, singing the Psalms, and worshiping at the Jerusalem temple and in the local synagogues. Jesus himself taught in the synagogues and in the cities and villages in the region and also went to teach in the temple. Luke opens and closes his gospel in the temple. And he shows how God reveals his word and his will in the temple when Jesus was dedicated. He stresses Jesus' involvement with the synagogue and temple worship right the way throughout the whole gospel. John builds his whole gospel around the Jewish festivals, dividing Jesus' life into set periods. After describing the first week of Jesus' ministry, John comments on the events associated with the Passover, an unspecified festival, probably Purim, and then a second Passover, then the Feast of the Tabernacles, a Feast of de Dedication, and a third Passover. And we see then that John's Gospel takes great pains to present Jesus as the fulfillment of all these important festivals. And into the time of the church in the book of Acts, we find that the first believers after Pentecost continued to worship at the temple and in the synagogues. When we're looking at communion as Paul treats it in 1 Corinthians, we see that Paul was setting that in the context of the morality that he was calling forth from the people in Corinth. One of the things that he was concerned about more than anything else was the lack of unity in that fellowship. And he was pointing out that when people had the communion service, they were breaking every rule and every principle of Christian unity and love and uh, therefore they were coming under severe judgment. 
He was reminding them that so often when they met for their communion services, those wealthy people who were able to come quickly and gather with the other wealthy folk, leaving the poorer, sometimes the servants, and those who had other things to do, other responsibilities before they got to the meeting, they were left behind. And uh, the richer folk were used to eating earlier, and the servants had to wait on them and then have their meal much later on in the evening. And so the rich folk came early, gathered together, brought great big hampers full of food, and they sat down and had a fantastic feast. And some of them were even overindulging, not just in what they were eating, but also in what they were drinking and getting drunk right there. And uh, Paul says, this is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. And then later on, the poorer workers would come in and have very little to eat, and everybody else had eaten, and he said, this is not the Lord's Supper. You're not considering one another. And the thing that you say is uh, supposedly worship to God actually is bringing judgment upon you. And this reminds us of the Old Testament times when the people of God so frequently fell into an exaggerated sense of uh, security while they were worshiping God with their ritualistic worship, worship feasts and rituals, and yet their hearts were far from him. And so, in, this is a similar situation here in Corinth. Paul says, you can't do it that way. This isn't worship. This isn't worship in spirit and truth. What actually you are doing is, uh, is contrary to every principle of fellowship. Fellowship is participating together, sharing together, considering one another. And so he said, this is not the Lord's Supper that you are eating. You're not discerning the Lord's body. And this shows us the power and significance of every worship act in general, but also the communion service in particular. And it's the power of it that I wanted to stress before we, we move on. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 29, uh, Paul says here, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And so how important it is in terms of fellowship that we should recognize one another and consider one another. And as we were looking at last time, Paul is presenting this teaching about the Lord's Supper and its rightful place in the life and worship of the people in Corinth in the context of considering one another and realizing that we can't use our freedom uh, as a dis to disadvantage other people, to put a stumbling block in the way of other people. And now he says in exactly the same way that we must consider one another, whether we eat meat, sacrifice to idols, which we have freedom to do, but if we put a stumbling block in somebody else's way, then it suddenly is not uh, right after all. And here this shows a very important distinction between Old Testament thinking and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the emphasis was very much upon following certain rituals and fulfilling certain uh, regulations. But in the New Testament, uh, the regulation that we're free, we're free to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, the women were free to pray before God with their heads uncovered. But when you come together, he says, this is a shame because you are putting a stumbling block in the way of others who would look at this and say, how can you Christians behave like that? You're breaking every social custom and convention. And so Paul says, remember that the freedom you have in Christ, which is a principle, which is your right and privilege, is not to be something that you abuse, certainly not to put a stumbling block in the way of, in the way of your brother. So the difference is this. In the New Testament, it is a question of attitude. It's a question of inner motivation. And at times, we are prepared to lay aside our rights and our privileges and our freedoms in order to minister effectively to other people and according to the principle of love to honor them and to consider them. And Paul says, in the context of the communion, if you abuse your privileges and if you uh, undermine the freedom that other people have and you break the principle of fellowship and not discern the Lord's body, it brings judgment to you. And he says, this is why some of you are, are ill and some of you have even died. Now, this shows us that the communion service is something very, very, very powerful. And uh, so when we look at the communion service as an act of worship, 
It's not to be treated lightly, as indeed anything that's to do with worshiping the Lord. It's not to be treated lightly. One more point about the power and significance of the communion service before we move on. We know that the communion service was instituted by Jesus in the context of a Passover meal. And there are certain elements of that which carry on into the New Testament practice of communion services. For example, Jesus said, he took the cup of blessing and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so he's saying, yes, there is a covenant, but it's a new covenant. There's a cup of blessing, but it's a new blessing. It's the blessing of the new covenant. And so there is a continuity uh, carry on from the Passover to the communion service, but there's also a discontinuity. There's something similar about it, but there's also something different. And uh, when we see the Passover meal in the history and the life of the Jewish people, we can see how significant and how important the communion service is for our lives as New Covenant believers. The uh, Passover meal was a memorial feast. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death. This is a memorial feast. Jesus said, do this in memory of me. Now the memorial supper is a proclamation and a participation. It's not a mere symbolic reenactment. In other words, the bread and the wine, while they remain bread and wine, are for us instruments, powerful instruments of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit works and acts through the communion to do something very, very special. It's a memorial feast. It's a proclamation of the historic event which is at the center of our faith and which we participate in every time we take communion. Now, this means that the meal is not an attempt to keep something long dead, to keep it alive, uh, because it's Christ's life which is remembered. We focus on his saving death, an event of unique significance, which reaches from the past, but it's through the present, into the future, and forward into eternity. There is a very real sense that this memorial feast is a participation in the things that are remembered. Now, a memorial is not m a mere reminder. A memorial is a participation in that which has been set forth. And so we see that when we remember him, it's not just remembering that he came and he died, it's remembering that he's present, remembering that he is there with us to participate with us and to share with us and we with him in that particular event. And this all happens until he comes. It is an anticipation of the future as well as a present participation. Paul says, do this, uh, and you sh as often as you do it, you, sh you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so this suggests to us that the communion service is to be a central focus in our public worship, not only uh, for, for, for the sake of uh, this present age in which we receive from Jesus, but as a, as a pointer towards the future. And so I've stressed that today before we move on in order to show you that we need to get back to making the communion service a central part of our worship. Now, different branches of the Christian church emphasize this in different ways. I remember when we had one of our church services, which was broadcast live on television, on national television. And uh, we had a lot of good comments, and there were some, one or two negative comments, coming from people from a different church tradition that couldn't understand why we had no liturgy, and also couldn't understand why, in that particular service, there was no Eucharist. And uh, it was easy for me, as a, as a free churchman, easy for me as a spirit-filled, charismatic believer where we believe in spontaneity and we reject uh, liturgy, perhaps a little bit too glibly, and uh, where we don't always, in every service, celebrate what they call the Eucharist. By the way, the, the term Eucharist comes from the Greek word Eucharistio, where Jesus gave thanks and blessed the, the bread and the wine. Um, 
It simply is a meaning giving thanks. And we do give thanks for the bread and wine. We also give thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ who gave us this and instituted this. So it's not a bad term, but it's a term that is usually used by those who have come from a different church tradition from the one that I'm, I'm in. And it's easy for us to look down on other people and say, you, you're doing it wrong and, and, and we're doing it right. We need to remember that the essence of worship is not the outward form. The essence of worship is the heart. And I reflected on that and realized that we Pentecostals and Charismatics so often, especially in the free churches, we so often neglect the Lord's table. And we don't make it a central part of our, of our worship. And when we do have a communion, we, we, it's often an adjunct to the service. It's not a central part of it. And we do need to work out more and more and before the Holy Spirit, ways in which we can express the heart of God when we share communion together. Now, I speak more about this in the Glory in the Church seminar in the series of the Sword of the Spirit, and I refer you to that. Now, I want to move on. Worship and spiritual gifts. Now, we are flowing on from what we did in the previous session, and coming to spiritual gifts, we're looking at the third practical difficulty that the Corinthians were facing in their public worship. Uh, the other two, if you recall, the first one was women who were praying and prophesying and participating in public services with their heads uncovered. And I, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier, or referred to it, when I was talking about the cultures and customs. Then the second problem was that of communion service, how they were, were dishonoring the Lord's body in the way that they were celebrating communion. Now, the third practical difficulty that they were facing was this matter of spiritual gifts. And uh, I mention it in this teaching on worship because we know that true worship is worship in the Holy Spirit. And uh, I've covered uh, spiritual gifts in the other courses on the Holy Spirit, the seminar on knowing the Spirit, and also we touch on it a little bit in the seminar on ministering in the Holy Spirit. So this is now not going to be an exposition of spiritual gifts, but it is to remind us that wherever the Holy Spirit is present, and if we are truly worshipping in the Spirit, we will expect the manifestation of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul says in Corinthians, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone to profit everybody. And so when we come together to worship God, we are there to glorify him, but in the context of our worship, we are there to edify one another, to build one another. And so our worship is to be edifying, to strengthen one another. And this shows us the second arm of the true two-pronged approach to worship. Worship is worshiping God, but also serving one another. Worship has its vertical and horizontal directions. Vertically, we worship God and honor Him and praise Him. Horizontally, we minister to one another and we bless one another. And Jesus put it this way as He was summarizing the most important laws of the Old Testament. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in one of the later sessions, we'll be talking about the practical implications of that second arm, the horizontal dimension. Because it's one thing to say we worship God whom we don't see and love Him, but what about our brothers and sisters whom we do see? How we, we treat one another, friends, is a reflection on how we truly worship God. And it's not enough for us to say, well, I worship God with my eyes tilted towards heaven and my hands raised in that ever so holy uh, gesture and, we, and we're raising our hands to worship God but when we get down from that high place of, of, uh, of pretentious worship we're using those same hands to point the finger at other people and we're not walk, walking with one another. And so we see this is real. Worship is real. Worship in spirit and truth is talking about being real. And how can you cur uh, bless God and then at the same breath go and curse your brothers and sisters and say, well, here we are, I'm, I'm a true worshiper after all. If you are a true worshiper, it will govern and control and direct the whole of your life. He's not concerned just about the few phrases we repetitiously, repetitiously say when we come into his presence, so-called, in church services. He is concerned also, and sometimes more so, with how we treat one another and how we live our lives 
before God in respect of the totality of our experience. And so, when we come together to worship God, we have a desire in the Spirit to build one another, to strengthen one another, and to minister to one another, as well as receiving from God his ministry to us. And this is where spiritual gifts come in. These were, in my opinion, a fundamental part of the early church. I've heard some argue that because spiritual gifts are mentioned only in Corinthians and one or two other uh, rather brief cursory mentions in other parts of the, of the epistles, that therefore spiritual gifts were not extensively used throughout the whole of the early church. This to me is an unacceptable position because what Paul says in Corinthians applies to the whole body of Christ uh, because it, he obviously is going to the Corinthians and speaking to them about spiritual gifts because they were abusing spiritual gifts. The epistles aren't an attempt by on behalf of the Apostle Paul or the other authors of the epistles to present some kind of systematic doctrine that we should gather and bind in our doctrinal statements. What he is talking about, and there's great doctrine, of course, in the epistles, and the, but the doctrine is given very often in a corrective fashion in order to correct imbalances, to speak into a situation like in the, the church of Colossae, which was involved in a kind of heresy, a heretical teaching. They were falling away into that. So Paul has to write to them to correct them. And the Corinthians, they were abusing spiritual gifts. He writes to correct. And so what we have to do when we think about the teaching of the New Testament on this subject or any of the subjects is to draw from what he is writing and construct, therefore, a more uh, a systematic understanding of what God is saying to us about spiritual gifts. So we see that spiritual gifts were widespread. Why would I say that? Paul speaks about the manifestation of the Spirit being given to everybody. And so we see from that, not just the Corinthians were gifted in spiritual gifts, but every believer that was open to the Holy Spirit, every spirit-baptized believer, every spirit-filled believer, every sp believer that was concerned to submit to the Holy Spirit would be spiritually empowered and spiritually endowed with gifts in order to minister to their brethren. And how relevant then this is to the context of spiritual worship when we come together to edify one another and we come together full of the Holy Spirit to bless God and to hear from Him. So spiritual gifts were therefore a fundamental part of the early church. And they knew that they had been uh, uh, anointed with the Spirit and the Holy Spirit had inspired them and empowered them to pray in tongues and to interpret tongues, to prophesy, to work miracles, to discern spirits, and so on. But it seems that the Corinthian believers were experiencing all these gifts of the Spirit and were so eager to use them that several people, at least, were manifesting them publicly in church services at the same time. They weren't preferring one another. Everybody was standing up just to show off their tongue to everybody else. And there was complete disorder because of their spiritual immaturity and also because of the divisiveness, the division that was in them. Paul writes to them and says, I couldn't instruct you as mature believers. I've got to speak to you as children. You're immature. In fact, in some ways, I've got to deal with you in some aspects of your life and your work together and your, your, your fellowship together. I have to speak to you as if you, were, you didn't even have the Holy Spirit. I have to speak to you as if you were mere carnal people because that's how you're behaving. This tells us that spiritual gifts are gifts. They're not rewards for holiness and maturity. They're not some kind of trophy that you win because you've done some magnificent exploit for God. They are gifts. They are gracelets, gifts and manifestations of God, which means, therefore, that they're not a mark of maturity. The fruit of the Spirit is a mark of maturity, not spiritual gifts. Now, when we come to charismatic worship, and by that I mean worship, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit, where God gives in great quantity his gifts and this liberal pouring out of the gifts of the Spirit that God has for us, and that the exercise of those gifts in worship, that does not necessarily mean that you are a mature person. 
In fact, often, people who are spiritually gifted at times depend on their spiritual gifting and forget that behind the charisma should lie a character, a character which is molded and shaped and directed by the Holy Spirit so that we have mature worship. There's a lot of immaturity in worship. So often people showing off the Sermon on the Mount addresses this. As Jesus said, don't do your deeds of righteousness before men to be seen by them. When you pray, don't make it a pretense of making long prayers or, or repetitious prayers and so forth. So right throughout all of this teaching on worship in spirit and truth, we see the heart attitude is so important. And Paul says, what you're doing, showing off and, and boasting before one another and uh, playing the games of spiritual one-upmanship, putting one another down while you are exalting yourself through the exercise of your spiritual gifts. He says, this is bringing sheer confusion. And he says, God is not the author of confusion. He's the God of peace. So this means that when spiritual gifts are manifested in public worship, they should occur in a way that the whole body can benefit. And the whole motivation behind the exercise of spiritual gifts must be the development of the body of Christ. These gifts are given that the body may profit, that everybody may profit. And so Paul, of course, acknowledges the validity of all the gifts that were being manifested in the Corinthian services, including tongues. In fact, he says, I thank God that I speak with tongues more than all of you. Now, he had to be quite a tongue talker to, get a, to talk in tongues more than the Corinthians were doing it. He said, it's not tongues that's wrong, it's the way you're using it. And with spiritual gifts, we need to remember that the way to handle the abuse of spiritual gifts is not to reject them altogether, but to teach and to practice the correct use of the gifts of the Spirit. But he kept on, kept on stressing that these gifts were given by God and had a place in public worship, but they must be handled correctly. He explained that just as the human body has different parts, which all contribute to the effective functioning of the body, so the different gifts and members all contribute to the church's worship service. And that brings to an end today's teaching on worship in spirit and truth. And I pray that as you've been watching and listening, God has been drawing you closer and closer to himself. There's no greater thing on earth than being a worshiper of the Father in the name of Jesus. And so until next time, goodbye and God bless you.